I should be standing here. That's it. That's good. That's good. Okay. So uh, my name is uh, Vasu Srinivasan, and uh, I'm going to be talking about Spring Boot today. First, to thank uh, the Austin uh, Grails and Groovy User Group for for this opportunity uh, for making this happen. Uh, how many of you are, are working with Spring Boot now? You are not counted. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. <laughs> okay, so that's good. So you guys will believe whatever I say then. <laughs> we can of, of course verify back and say that oh, that was not right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Spring Boot. Um, it's a pretty new technology here as as far as Spring is concerned, but not in general. But I'm this is kind of a Groovy a Grails user group meeting, so I'm going to focus more on the the Groovy side of Spring Boot and what you can really do with with that one. A lot of examples you can find online for uh, Java based stuff and XML based stuff. If you type in Spring, you just get like all kinds of XML everywhere. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to go into focus on, on the, the GUI side of it and how we can really start using it, where the benefits really are. So I, uh, I'm a senior technology consultant. Uh, that's my Twitter, that's my blog. I have some slides over there. So Eric was mentioning that we have, we did a uh, Presentation called Battle of Programming Languages. It's on YouTube if you just find it. That's about the technology that are. So currently working on Groovy, Grails, AngularJS, SharePoint, and kind of stuff. Um, he's already gone through this one. So these are some of the applications that we have built uh, in NIC. Texas.gov, that's on SharePoint, actually one of the big, bigger ones. And some licensing applications. If any of you have concealed handguns, we, and we've got the license for that. Uh, we built that one too. Birth certificates, death certificates. And some of the other ones. <coughs> anyway, so uh, welcome to Spring in Boots. Uh, 3G, that's for Groovy, Grails, or sorry, Groovy, GORM, and uh, Gradle. <coughs> so first thing we, uh, before, before we even say that Spring Boot, we need to understand why, what is really wrong with Spring Framework right now? What is Spring MVC or whatever the Spring, this, what, is, what is the problem with that? And I think the key issue is uh, scalability, one of, the, one of the biggest problems there with these kind of applications where you run in a server container. Scalability becomes issue after some time where you start adding clusters and stuff. And at some point of time, it becomes very difficult to expand that. So uh, as a lot of other frameworks have found, Stateless services, uh, they actually provide better scalability. And there are a lot of techniques, now much easier techniques today to uh, create those kind of applications. <coughs> and um, standalone monolithic server containers like Tomcat, WebLogic, I mean, whatever I uh, heard of there. In some cases, actually, it's become a very specialized job. In, uh, I used to work with uh, IBM before, with IBM WebSphere. We had some people whose primary job was to start and stop web sphere. So it used to be it used to be like that. So it's like and I was working on the ZOS side of it. So there was a person who was just maintaining web sphere. That's it, get, making sure it's, it's running there. But a simple HTTP server is sufficient in most most of the times. We don't really need like so much complex configurations from the server side just to get uh, um, a Java application running. Another problem is how the application is deployed, it also forces how to write your code. For example, session, right? So you have, to, if you're writing in a server container with a cluster management system and your uh, session is like database back, something like that, so you have to make sure that you are using sessions properly, setting it sometimes properly, reading it, and the, even if it's something is lost, you have to be kind of like have some fail safe mechanisms how to treat those things. Conceptually, this will not change. Like any, any new deployment container you go, you still are forced to like kind of know how, how your application is deployed. But if there is some freedom in deployment, it actually helps you a lot in, in your how to maintain your application. But that's what we'll see how Spring Boot might help over there. And also, the ramp up time to create a Spring application, MVC application using the, XX, using the traditional way, it's actually very, very high. It takes a lot of time to get the XML beans wired, set up, and all that stuff, and then try to get an application running. Many of the modern frameworks, they don't really have that one. So things like Play uh, or even Grails, for example, you just download Grails, create app, run app, and that's it, you're ready. But Spring is not, was not there. So why Spring Boot? <coughs> so XML as a configuration, uh, it was a great idea at the time when it was introduced. It was a great idea probably for 
for a few months. But I think that that time is gone. <laughs> Uh, so obviously we know that it's it's verbose, bloated, and very error prone. There are lot there there are not even tools for quite a while until uh, Eclipse started supporting XML beans, making sure the beans are valid, all those kind of stuff. Uh, many web application frameworks that came after Spring, they actually don't use XML at all for their configuration. I mean things like I mean obviously Rails was one of the uh, very innovative frameworks there. Rails even Rails which Actually, on top of Spring, I, I don't think we really ever used uh, XML at all in that one. And Play, for example, is pretty innovative there. We could, these, these applications really don't need XML configurations at all. They were like anti-XML movement probably happened at that time. And again, the ramp up time is very important criteria. Yes, how, how fast I can download a framework or an uh, and start writing my own application, uh, Hello World, or even some, something more than Hello World. That's actually very important criteria. If it takes like half a day to figure out how to run an application, I don't think it's going to get another look at all. <coughs> if, if, if you have worked with Play, I think it's like you just download it, just create an app, install one, just like Rails. So it's, it makes very simple to write uh, simple applications or starter applications. Um, and there is a new thing, not, not a new thing actually. So there, there is this terminology going on, the opinionated frameworks like drop wizard, even rails to some extent, they are kind of becoming fashionable in some sense, not, not all the time, but uh, some people say like it's, it's good to have an opinionated way of doing things. And some people say, no, I, I need all the freedom to what I, whatever I want. So it's kind of like a mixed bag uh, sometimes there. And so given all this situation, the issues with spring and ramp up times and scalability, spring had to do something. So because there are a lot of other frameworks that's coming up, like uh, are coming up or have been written like Drop Wizard, Rat Pack, and most of them started with Sinatra, I think, and Scalatra. They were all tagging on the bandwagon called microservices architecture. In fact, there's a very nice article on InfoQ that, that came up. Somebody tweeted, actually. Uh, it's, it's very nice. It's, it's a very good read on what microservices architecture is. Kind of distributed, kind of SOA concepts are there. But it, it's a lot more simpler than what uh, SOA is. Uh, I think SOA also started with the same kind of concepts, but it kind of ran with the commercial um, stuff a lot. But I think there's a lot of sanity here in, in microservice architecture. And hopefully, it will stay that way. <sighs> Spring has a lot of supporting frameworks and libraries. Like, uh, first of all, it's a dependency injection mechanism. It's pretty solid. And there's Spring Data, there's Spring um, XD, which is for big data, there's Spring Security, so much libraries they've already written, and but there is no easy way to tie them up all. So that's what Spring Boot is. So that's why Spring Boot, I think, makes sense from the Spring's perspective to give something for the developer community to be more productive than uh, it was ever before. So I always wonder why it's called Spring Boot. Uh, so okay, before we go, with, uh, we'll see what an opinionated framework is. So. It's either frameworks that have strong opinions about themselves or frameworks by developers who have strong opinions about what goes in. I think it's one of those two. I don't know exactly what it is. In some sense, I feel that any software code we write is opinionated some way because we think that's, that's the right way to do it and that's why we do it. But I think that's kind of term is ca catching on somehow. So why do, why do they call it boot? I wonder. I don't know exactly why, but uh, this is my theory. Spring booted XML out, and that's why it's called Spring Boot. Uh, well, it's of course <laughs> that's only the unofficial version of the story. <laughs> I don't know what really went, went behind it. Anyway, so what's what what is Spring Boot? It's a container project for creating new uh, Spring-based applications. So instead of XML-based applications, there is a different way to create applications, and we'll see a couple of demos with that one how to do that. Go on. The first thing it, you will notice is it comes with an embedded servlet container. That means you already have a container when you run your application. So you're not running your application. You're not creating a WAR file anymore. You're actually creating a JAR file, a simple JAR file, which contains all the libraries that you need, including the Tomcat servlet container by default. So you just run as the application as a regular Java dash JAR, the file name, and you already have a container running. So that's that's one of the first first things. Again, it's not it's not new to Spring Boot. I mean, uh, Drop Wizard 
was was one of the first things that invented this kind of this kind of uh, uh, technique. So it kind of a lot of starter prompts for many libraries. We'll see some of the starter prompts what what they actually do, but what it really means is like it bundles a lot of other dependent libraries together. It makes it easier. So it's it's something like a facet, I can say. So I want web application development. I just include web starter web, and I get all the web on the Tomcat container, those kind of stuff. If you say I want database connectivity, I include the starter JDBC. I get everything over there. So starter prompts do a little bit more than just including the libraries. They have this concept called auto configuration, with which Spring tries its best to discover what are the the jar files in the class path. And based on that, it tries to configure. For example, if there is no database, if there is a JDBC uh, available, starter form available, and there is no database specified, it will automatically configure to use a HSQL DB in memory database. So we don't have to do anything at all. So th there are a lot of things it does uh, like that. So something called actuators, again, it's very popular when Drop Wizard came. So the application itself is responsible for providing your health check, your metrics, and a lot more than that. So Spring borrowed some of those concepts there. So as soon as you have your application running, you have a health check available by default. I mean, obviously, you can customize a lot of stuff. You can have the metrics like trace, trace dump, and all that stuff. So it's kind of like monitoring? Yes, your monitoring is built in, actually, built in your, built in your application itself. And you don't have to do anything, really. I work with Spring Insight. This is kind of similar to that, but it's a profiler. And it just reads the uh, application performance from start, uh, I mean, from request to response. That's right, yes. Same thing? That's right, yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know exactly what Insight is, but. Insight wraps your war file and runs an instrumentation around it. They have right. instrumented Spring classes. This is actually just a, a set of services built in that are like a REST service that you can get the help of the application, right? right. The monitoring tool can plug right in and say mm. something's wrong or, uh, you know. Yeah, the health check probably checks the database, database ch health check and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, the, it, it also has services like shutdown. So if you enable a certain, certain property, you can actually shut down the application from the browser. So, and also it has a telnet, uh, SSH telnet there. So you can actually remote telnet into your application and do some stuff. I not tried that, but that's some of the documentation actually. So uh, it supports it supports XML, Java, annotated Java, and Groovy Bean configurations. You will not find a lot of documentation on the Groovy Bean configuration, but XML and Java annotated there is a lot of stuff. But again, XML configuration is not mandatory anymore. We don't really need to do any any beans XML at all. <coughs> Has advantages and disadvantages, but we'll see some of those things there. Obviously, Spring supports a lot of databases. It has a wrapper for pretty much everything around. You take like Elasticsearch, there is a wrapper. You take like Redis, there is a wrapper. Neo4j, there is a wrapper. MongoDB, there is a wrapper. So pretty much on all, all sorts of SQL databases, it has a wrapper. So it's very solid on that. <coughs> and uh, one of the main advantages, it, it helps blend the web and the non-web. So when we deploy a WAR file, we assume that it's a web application. But there are some tasks that we, we would like to do from the web file itself, for example, batch processing. But it's not. The, the 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 web content is not the right place to do batch processing. Kind of like becomes not not uh, not, not very intuitive actually there. But putting it the other way, Spring Boot helps you kind of keep both the web functionality and the non-web functionality in a much cleaner way. And we'll see an example of that uh, in the demo. It supports uh, supports many views. Uh, JSP is there uh, by default, I think, but it's limited. That's what they say. Timeleaf, it's some other framework. It's pretty pretty popular, I guess, but I've not used it myself. And the new one called Groovy Template Engine that just released like a few days ago, I guess. I think the great comp they made some you know, talk about that too. So we'll see an example of Groovy Template Engine over here. And this was uh, this is supported by Spring Boot 1.1.0, which was released um, two days ago. Mm -hmm. One one yeah. is already up, actually. Yeah. So it was released in 1.0, 1110, and then they fixed some issues with the Gradle plugin, and that's 1.1.1.1. So, how can we use Groovy here, right? So traditional Spring applications are mostly in Java, as I said, Stack Overflow and all, mostly about Java Java examples there. But we all know that Groovy is a much smoother and richer language, and we should be able to take some advantage of that one. And uh, so Groovy enriches Spring Boot in many ways. And for example, 
there is a there is a download called spring dash cli i think command line interface you can write simple groovy scripts in in just like one file and then say spring run apps, let's say app.groovy and you can, it, it actually runs it so you can do uh, rest services or um, database connectivity and all that stuff in a groovy script and you can do that one but i think my my kind of problem would that be would, would anyone do that in prod i don't know any, i don't know if anyone would be running like scripts like in prod unless you have a very narrow functionality that like extract some data over here and there those kind of things otherwise i don't know i personally don't know if there is any other advantage of that one in writing a full fledged application you can write groovy as the language instead of java so you can totally not use java at all in spring boot use only groovy all you have to do is like two things one is apply a plugin groovy in the gradle and then put the groovy version groovy jar version in the in the gradle and that's it you can write groovy code just like regular code and the another thing is they have a groovy beam configuration so if you are in the grails and uh, framework we have this resource dot, resources dot groovy there are a lot of customized spring beans that we can define S that's basically the groovy bean configuration they expanded that concept into what is called groovy bean definition reader and you can write xml beans what you uh, what you wrote in xml the beans what you wrote in xml in groovy dsl and it will just wire up wire them up very nicely and groovy dsl is very nice in my opinion it, it looks it, it looks very readable obviously the tooling support is still not there as far as the um, type safety and all that is concerned but hopefully it will come up soon but yeah that's that's the only part that we are we are on our own but otherwise it looks very nice actually Groovy template engine. So we'll see an example of that. You can. We don't really need a HTML. Obviously, there are cases where it's it's uh, practical, I guess. Well, HTML is much more universal. But there are. I think there are some cases where we can use a Groovy template engine, especially if you want to create an email template, or if you let's say if you have an order history. I only want to just display history, data. That's it. I don't want to do anything else with that one. Or like a transaction record, if you have. A submit a transaction record. You search for it and you display that one. Instead of converting into a model and then from the model into the HTML or JSON, all that stuff, Groovy template engine gives a very nice, nice way to uh, get the data into an HTML format. And I will see an example of that. It's very, very, very nice in some cases. Gorm, um, obviously, uh, we are all big fans of that. Thankfully, it was a spin-off from Grails. It, it used to be very tied to Grails before. Now it's spin-off separately. And then all you have to do is like add this uh, GARM Hibernate for Spring Boot. It's already in GA right now. And that's it. And annotate the class with at entity. So in, in Grails, you would put all the domains in the all the domain classes in the domain directory or domain folder. Here in Spring Boot, you just annotate with at entity, uh, Grails persistence entity. We got a GARM working. Uh, we got all the power of GOM there. So, what are the real uh, highlights? I mean, it, I think there are, there is still, still some hesitance in um, using Groovy for Spring Boot kind of applications. There are definitely some reasons to consider uh, why not why not Groovy. First is it, it's uh, pretty practical and uh, it has some practical and time saving annotations: two string, log, equals, and hash code. There, there are so many things like that. I mean, you just put them all. I don't even have to worry about that. It's it's very nice. Um, I, I think it's, it's, this was done on Twitter some time ago. There, has, there have been some benchmark comparisons with Groovy 2.3, very fast JSON conversions using, I think it uses the Boon, right? It's, it's the Boon behind it, the uh, framework. And it, it provides much faster conversions than the Jackson or, G, or the JSON even. Null safe operations, obviously, we know all these things from Groovy. And Groovy strings are much more powerful than regular ones. Spark using using t testing using Spark is again like provides a lot of advantages. I think there are already some um, in GitHub. There are some uh, samples that use Spark as a uh, test framework for Spring Boot, so it's pretty interesting. And with 2.3, and a lot of classes can be compiled with compile static, and it provides as much as performance as, as a regular Java class does. Actually, so it's 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 definitely worth a look. It has come a long way. Okay, um, let's try. Uh, First demo tried as, as I said, it's one of the uh, benchmarks for creating a new uh, new using a new framework is how fast you can create an application, right? So let's try to create an application. Do you have an internal connectivity here? Yes. So they have a, a nice um, 
web page called start.spring.io, Spring Initializer. So with this, you can create the, the basic uh, project structure that you need in order to get a Spring Boot application working. So I'm just going to say, um, say, so I was trying with this one before. Just say demo, demo, demo. Okay, so here are, it says tiles, but basically the, the, the faces I was talking about, do you want a web-based project? Or do you want a, a JDBC there? You want a security? Do you want batch processing? Do you, what, whatever you want to use, you can just choose any of these things, and it will create the starter prompts for you. It will add that in the, in the middle. So for this, I will just say I, I want a uh, web, and um, I think I just, that's just enough. Just want to, just want to put a JDBC here, just in case. Start.spring.io, start okay. yeah. And I'm, I'm going to use a Gradle project. Uh, I, I haven't worked with Maven for a while. And again, you can see the packaging is jar or war. You can do war files too from Spring Boot, because if you eventually want to deploy to a Tomcat, Tomcat container, somebody from your operations team is saying, no, we need containers, that's it. We, it's in our control. So in that case, yeah, you need to deploy a war. Otherwise, yeah, depends on who speaks loudest, yeah. OK, I'm going to use the language as Groovy over here. And when I say generate, it actually gives me a zip file. I had to do some massaging after that one, but otherwise it's fine. So I noted a couple of steps that we need to do. Um, so we just downloaded the file, and then we had to add some default um, little ar artifacts in order to make it working. So what I'm going to do is just copy from a different. Um, this over there, I think I need a Gradle here. <coughs> Uh, I think there's still, a, still one issue with the uh, Spring up, Spring application that it's doing. So when they create an application.groovy file, they just give like nothing there. It's probably a bug over there. So I'm going to replace it with an, is a proper application, and we'll go go through that application after that. So that makes a, that makes the uh, simple spring spring application here, and I think I should be able to run it after this. How the So if you look at before I run that, I just want to show the Gradle file here, what it really generated. So you can see that it's used to Spring Boot version 1.1.0. I think they're not updated to 1.1.1, but that's the latest one. So uh, so here, here, here's the dependencies over there. So starter web, starter JDBC, and starter test. And also it says add uh, Groovy, compare, Groovy also to the class path. So that's it. It brings pretty much everything. The starter web is the one that is responsible for getting the uh, getting the Tomcat in the class path for running it. So I remember yesterday from yesterday when I was trying this, I don't need this one. It gives some errors, so I'm going to just take it out for now. Some errors. No, it doesn't like some database over there. Anyway, 
I am not going to debug this one, but uh, it is probably saying that data source is not uh, available. I think it is because I did not provide the HC, HC equal DB uh, for that one. And when I say database is there, let me see, just take out this one. See. I know I have the JDBC over here, so it is trying to look for some database drivers, I guess. There you go. So, it just started the application. So, the first thing is we can notice that um, there is one more thing I, I want to add actually. Just try that. I should have done that. So, when I when I created this one, there was something called actuators here. I should have uh, selected that one, but I forgot to select that. So, I am just going to add that right now. So, you can see pretty how simple it is to uh, add these things. Actuators, there it is. Okay. Okay, so when I add the actuators here, we get the the things that we talked about: health check, metrics, tracing, dump, all that stuff automatically. So you can see it, it created kind of a lot more uh, beans over there. It kind of configured that. So there is something called environment endpoint, health check endpoint. All these are services, and if you want to look at what it's what they are doing. So, just say localhost and then say let us say beans for example. Okay, it is in plain JSON it displays all the beans that has been configured so far right uh, in this application. Uh, let us say like uh, health check it says just up there is no database there but it just says up there and say metrics there you get like um, uptime heat structure and all that stuff. It is all this is all done by actuators. I think there are I think in the beans you can find them I, I do not think it not there is so anything that specifically does that. It lists out like all of the endpoints that it is exposing when it starts up. I am assuming you can turn these off if you want to. Right? Yes you can turn them off actually yeah of course obviously yeah. <laughs> yeah there, there are properties for actually Spring Boot lists a lot on properties a lot lot on properties so you can pretty much turn anything off you do if you don't like it like in fact there is one for the banner too if you if the beginning if the beginning you saw there is a banner over there it's kind of become very popular this this thing there is a property that says banner show banner false mm -hmm. or if you want your own banner you can just replace that too so kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh now let's say i think config props i think there is another one so all the properties over there so that's another one uh what you can actually have it where it starts up the uh, the management endpoints under a different port. You can have it listed under a different host name. Um, you can you can have it list uh, publish them under a different context. So you can protect that with you know Spring Security or something like that. So that's all configurable. Yeah. Yeah. So auto configuration. So uh, we talked about auto configuration. Basically, it's it's a way to for Spring. It it really works when the startup prompts are there. It makes a best guess based on what is there in the class path class path. So, if there is a H C equal db jar file in the class path it will set up some properties for it it will set up some default properties for using H C equal db. If it finds h2 h2 db in the class path it will configure itself for using h2 db. So, that is what auto configuration does automatically. So, most of the things it will figure it out and even if, if you do not want something we can always override the beans with what we with the same bean name ours will take precedence and there is a big hierarchy of stuff in the reference documentation you can look at that how we can override some properties uh, uh, it actually relies a lot on properties actually. So, you can override the properties first at the um, when you are calling the java dash jar at the command level or you can have a, a class a, a properties file on the local directory etcetera. So, there is a there is a level of um, uh, hierarchy that that which it goes through actually which takes precedence. So, okay, yeah, so it is less than 5 minutes uh, really. So, to get a simple application working and we get a lot of functionality, not not our functionality, but from the container perspective, what all we already get that. 
Okay. Um, that's like in, in Windows, actually. In Mac and Linux, it's much easier. Uh, there is a lazy bones template. Uh, I think Peter Ledbrook, mm -hmm. they have they've developed some nice templates there. Install GVM and then say create lazy bones, create something, and it automatically creates a Spring Boot template for you. So it's much easier over there. Okay. So that's basically what I did. Um, so one of the things we do, I don't really do is, is the log, logger, log4j. Um, um, when I was trying to experiment with Spring Boot, I had a lot of issues with lo logging. There are too many loggers being added in the in the class path. There is, there's just so many log loggers. I mean, SLF4j, log4j, logback, common dot logs dot util, and I don't know. There's so many log logging frameworks there. I think Spring tries to include everything, but somehow later on tries to figure out what to do with them. I had a tough time trying to see which logger really works, and but Spring itself, Spring team itself recommends logback, and I would just say like just pick a logback dot groovy from any if you're using groovy from somewhere, stick it in the class path, and it's already free after that. Okay, <coughs> so that's basically what it is. So actual does it gives you beans metrics health shutdown is not enabled by default, uh, trace and dump. So auto configuration and so many other beans. And then we, we saw that it, it automatically creates the ADAD AD, uh, server container and we are hitting it with the ADAD AD port. Okay, let's do a little bit more complex demo over here where I want to show how to use uh, REST services, both get and post, AngularJS as a client, client uh, for that one. And one of the things I was mentioning is how to blend web and non-web functionality. So we can do some batch processing there also, how to use Ruby bean configurations and template. All of this code is already there in the in the GitHub, and I have a link for that one. I'll post it later too. And also, Ruby template engine as a viewer, as I said, there are some specific cases where it's really pretty good. So, uh, okay. <coughs> so this project called Spring Boot Batch Sample. Uh, it's not. It's a it's a pretty simple project. Uh, I'll probably run it and then show what it does uh, after that. So, in development time, you can just say Gradle W boot run. But once you are ready for uh, deployment, you can just say Gradle W and then say build jar. It's going to run the test cases and then create a jar file, and then it's just deployed. That's you just give it to your ops team or whoever wants to deploy it, and that's it. Working because there's another server running on the same port. I thought I, I shut down that one. That's why I, I didn't check the right window. Here's uh, an application that's running. So you can see just from the log itself, it was trying to use a H2 database somewhere, I guess. It should be somewhere there. There it is. It's using a H2 dialect. That's because if you look at the uh, Gradle file here, where's that? So this is on the configuration. So start, starter web is there. Actuators, which gives me all the metrics and stuff. Batch processing. So again, I use a starter batch, which pr pretty much brings all the related batch-related uh, libraries for me. I don't have to go and figure out what I really need for that one. Logging, I just again just throw in there. And, and batch admin manager, if you want to manage my batch batch processes from online, like from a browser. And Groovy and Groovy templates. And H2 database finally here. So this is the one that's responsible for getting the uh, for the database driver for H2 H2, and the GARM on top of it. So I'll go. I'll show you how how this is working behind the scenes. And finally, there is also called Spring Loaded. Rails actually uses it by default. Spring Loaded is the one that makes you debug the uh, application, put in debug mode. So as you see, we're all running it as a command line. But if 
if you want to debug it so you can still use it in the IntelliJ there are some there is one option that you have to run with the JVM uh, with the VM option I'll show you what it is later on but but that's about it <coughs> so I want to have some pretty images for the demo so <laughs> what's basically doing is there's an angular js application or, or a html5 that is using a rest service to call into spring boot get the data which is supplying the data via uh, the GORM domain class and that's about it. And then when saving it, we just add some data over here. It does a REST service post to the uh, Spring, uh, Spring controller and it adds to the database. That's pretty much what it is there. But uh, you can see the, the simplicity behind it in, in running the whole thing. So here's the, here's the AngularJS application which uh, or HTML. Uh, HTML backed by AngularJS. So, anyone familiar with AngularJS here, or how does it work? Okay, so pretty much everyone knows. Right. Okay. Um, so it tries to get. So here's here's where the the data is got from. So there's uh, S in stars and gets the gets the data via REST, REST service. So stars is uh, added from controllers. So all it does is it goes to star. There's a REST API expose called star catalog list and get simple get get there rest get there and gets the data so how that works if you go to the spring side of it so source main ruby here is our domain object as i said it just annotated with at entity so you got a you got a go domain and here's the controller uh, let's see so uh, it's been served with a st slash star catalog URL and then within that list. So in the list, so you just go to a service and find all the stars. And all that does is really literally um, return star find all from, from the from the GOM API. So once it does that, so here is a catch. In Grails, if, if you just return the data access from the domain object as a list, it's available for you in GSP. But here, there is a risk mapping that goes on in, in between the two. So the data has to be converted to JSON. But I think Sp Spring Boot does not support, or the, the JSON uh, library that is responsible for converting the object into JSON, it does not support uh, fully all the elements that has been created within the GOM. GOM actually adds a lot more data that we actually see, right? So it, it doesn't really work. So if you just return start that dot list, JSON will comply. So what I have to do is, in that case, I just have to convert that into a regular list or a regular map. So that's basically what it's doing. So this is one of the gotchas. If you are just returning the uh, GOM data, uh, GOM object, back to the um, back to the client via JSON, it's not going to work. So you need to convert it to a command object or something like that. So that's basically what it is. It, get, it gets all the data here. And all we have in the data is uh, some some records, so like some stars, some some st some uh, nebulas and stuff. So if you want to add that one, so this is the, this is the rest rest get part of that one. So if you just want to create a new one, so you can just cre create a, a method called create, and you can see that it's a rec you have annotated with request body. So whatever comes in as JSON that has been sent by the Angular JS client, you just have to convert to your domain object, and that's about it. So once you get that one, it's done. And you have to use a method post over here so that you accept that post method on that on that uh, URL. So if you just try something here, so I'm going to go to pick for pick something over here from there. So let's say M78 diffuse nebula. Okay. Just going to put some numbers, and this is the link. So you can see that. So if I add it, that this data, what I am submitting from the form, and which is driven by the form over here. This is the form over here, it's, and that's actually submitted to the uh, via ng click attribute. The add order add star method is being called from the 
uh, from the controller over here. And all it does is it just takes the, takes the data, whatever is there in the scope, and posts it back to the URL that we have. And you, you have a very clean separation of what data goes in, comes out from the Spring Boot. And it's, it's all like each method is like only a couple of lines there to, to get it working. And once it's done, it returns the data back, uh, some response back, and it says successfully added something from the, and it's coming from the, uh, from the control itself. That's it. So that's, yeah. Did, uh, so the Spring, uh, Spring Boot, did they basically take out the view layer and you basically just transfer and do something? If, you, if you're using as a REST controller, so you can see that this controller, I have said it's like a REST controller here. So if you annotate that, that actually makes it REST enabled, that whole controller. So there is no view layer at that point. So you just send JSON and uh, JSON back and forth. That's you accept JSON. And, so you accept JSON by saying it's a response, sorry, request body. If it's a post, if it's returning, you just say response body. If annotated the response body, it actually sends a JSON. You don't have to do any conversion at all. And AngularJS by default works with JSON. So that's it. Yeah. This has nothing to do with Spring Boot. This is Spring MVC. Part. It could be. That's right. Yes. That's right. But but the advantage really is like I don't have a separate container, right? So I just create. It. Most of the things you can do it here. It, you can do it Spring MVC also if you are doing annotated stuff. Right. Okay. So the other portion of it is like so I said like web and non-web, right? So if you want to see. A batch processing on that one. So while we're running this application, you can see there, there are a lot, of, lot more stuff it was doing behind the scenes. So you can see there's a scheduler that's running, and it's creating a job, start job, doing something. So basically, the idea is like so all the stars that is being entered in the database, we take it and produce a text file out of that one every five minutes, let's say. So every five minutes, there's a job that's running, and the way you configure that is. And we can do it a lot of things with the auto wired stuff and like a sp regular Spring MVC here. But I just want to show the power of Groovy Beans also here. So, what it does in this case is here is the Groovy Bean configuration for the whole, the, oops. So, for the whole batch. So, I can, I can override instead of uh, auto wiring stuff with my own beans. And this is how the Groovy Bean definition looks like instead of XML, right? So you have the controller that pretty much looks like resources.groovy. There is one difference though, one very minor but important difference. In the resources.groovy, we used to have beans equals and then a bracket sign. Here you have beans and then without the equals bracket sign. I struggle I for a half a day to see why it's not working and then it's, that's the difference actually. So this is a slightly different way of doing that one. So you can also use the config object, which are very familiar in, in Groovy or the Grails application. It's um, you can define whatever you want in that one. So config object is pretty powerful, not like uh, properties or AML file. And environment blocks, everything is already defined there. You can use that directly inject over here. So that's another way of doing that. So here, what it's doing is like here's a, here's a bad job that I created, and I kind of like keeping the configuration of bad jobs in a separate file because it's easier to change those things. If you put in a Java annotated configuration, that means for any change that I need to do, I have to go to the code to make the changes and then recompile. So this actually, and I don't want to do XML. So it kind of provides a middle ground for me. I don't want to do Java and uh, get stuck with all the configurations uh, hardwired. Or I don't want to do XML. So this gives a very nice way of implementing that. Not only that, if you have the basic, let's say if you have a basic batch flow working, let's say reading some from some database, processing something and converting to a file, I can actually provide any number of uh, Groovy bean definition files at one time, and it will actually operate on that one. So that means like I have one batch processing file according to my needs, and then I have different, the, the processing units itself in my configuration. I don't have to write code for each and every of them. Because if you go with the Java annotated way, you have to make changes to the code every time for every business change you need. But here I can manipulate that externally. So that actually gives a lot more flexibility. And this is one of the things that we are doing right now in our, in our, in our uh, company too. So it, it provides a lot more so beans also. The Spring Batch Admin, it provides like job operator, job service, a lot more beans that it comes with it. We can use it to look into what the jobs are doing. So, so just for a simple Batch Admin controller over here, which takes those uh, job services and gets the data, some data from the running Running account, so 
job count, how many jobs are running, etc. How many executions have happened? So very simple thing, but you can see how I use the Groovy template engine for that one. So if I just say go and start um, actually batch. That's it. So this gives you a batch history of that one. But what what is backing this data is is a simple Groovy template engine. Uh, the template engines, my templates must be put in the um, put in the res resources templates directory. So that's how it actually knows where to get get it from. So you can see it looks like HTML, but in a Groovy style. So that's how it is. So nice thing about it is like all the models are directly callable there. So you can see that um, there is a there is a Groovy piece of code that's being executed here. So each closure it gets each job execution and displays what is the start time and end time. So for situations like this where you just want to display data, as I said, like order history or order transaction, you don't want to convert your whole data again into some kind of JSON or display it unless you need it, of course. I mean, if you need it to be externally accessible. But otherwise, you just want to display like static data. It's really, really very convenient because you kind of don't want to use JavaScript and all that stuff combined over here. So you just want a very simple thing. It's very perfect, pretty fast too. And if you make any changes, it automatically changes that one. So you don't have to restart the application. So that's about like so far about the Spring Boot uh, demo. So some things that uh, I found like uh, as I try to explore this one. So the good baffling and unexpected. It's always there for every this one. So the good things are uh, traditional XML developers, Spring MVC developers will find a lot of advantages in a lot of le less configurations there. And REST is made very easy. Deployment is made very easy too, as you saw that one. Auto configurations, again, you saw some of the examples there. Java annotated configurations are good it, in, in terms of type safety check, which was not, which is not available when you're doing Groovy configuration. So you're on your own at that point. So kind of have to make a decision when do you want to use uh, which one. The Gradle support is really awesome there. So Gradle is really very picking up a lot recently. And with uh, what I said, the new, new, what is it called? The new. Plugin portal, the plugin portal actually written with Rat Pack, so it's it's really pretty good actually. Out. Yeah, and some of the baffling stuff uh, about Spring Boot, there are so many ways of setting up the, setting up the properties. So by default, there is only application properties and application uh, ML. I would say like make a decision pretty early if you want to go M ML, just go ML. That's it. And uh, it's, it's it is a lot more. It's actually a superset of JSON. ML is superset, so you got a lot more functionality there. Uh, too many logging frameworks, as I said, uh, or including the class path. I would just say use log back, and that's it. Don't try to make decisions in these kind of things. That I, I just want to say, like avoid decisions on things that are so so at the so uh, lower level. And out of the box, prof out of the box profile support is not there. I think I wish it was there. So, for example, in Rails, you have uh, if you start an application, create an application config dot Groovy, automatically get that development block. Uh, Test block, production block, stage block, and all that kind of stuff. It's very easy. You have to kind of go and manually do all that stuff here. You have to make like application dash development, application dash stage kind of stuff. So in, in those cases, I think the Grails application's power is, is really missing for uh, somebody who has worked with Grails before. And too many configuration related annotations. It's something that I never it took a lot of time to even like figure out what is what. So there's auto configure configurations, enable configurations, properties everywhere. It's like you, see, you can see that annotation spread over on as far as configuration is concerned. It takes some time to understand what is applicable where, uh, in which which class when you want to use that one. Most of them, that's my personal opinion. It's not intuitive to apply. You have to really look at the reference documentation, see what is what is really applicable where, because you don't know what's doing, what it's doing behind the scenes, the compiler, and again. In general, I think if there are too many annotations there, you don't know what what is doing what at being post construct component scan. It's like it's like you feel like you're writing more annotations than code at sometimes. But another issue is like once you get past that auto configuration magic, so you want to start customizing some stuff, you have to go and find out what are the properties that you really need to find out. And documentation is the only thing, but it may not be uh, always there. So you have to go Stack Overflow or something, ask questions. The Spring Boot team is really good about answering back. So again, it takes some time to figure those things out. So be aware of that one. So it's not just like hunky-dory everything. Or it's the answer to everything. There are issues once you go 
like, just like any framework, like if we go to a certain point, there is some there are some issues there, and how well you deal with really makes it important. There are my views again. So uh, the recommended path from Spring, Spring Boot is like put in source main resources static, whether it is GSP or JSP or uh, a, a HTML. But I, I have so far not been comfortable with that approach at all because it makes your IDE kind of pretty deep. As you can see that here, it's a, it thinks that template.views is like a package here. Not only that, so if it goes deeper, it all looks like a package. When you refactor something, it adds a package something, package, blah, 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 template.views on the top of it. So the IDE kind of makes you, it, it thinks that it's a, it's a package there because resources, it thinks it's a code, code directory. So it, these things, are, that's why I have this uh, AngularJS separately in a public app, and I go to a different way. I still haven't figured the right mix of where to put this, uh, this one. There is a problem with this approach. Be when you build a jar file, these HTMLs won't get included because they, it's out, outside of the source main resources directory. So we have to, I mean, I, I, I don't answer for that one, but we have to do some gradual stuff to move that into the source main static, et cetera, when you're doing the builds. So I think there will be some kind of best practice will come soon on that one. So if you're using Bower or uh, SAS, there is no out of the box support just like you have for Grails and asset pipeline. So you have to do some gradual customizations when these things are. Pretty soon I think there will be some plugins coming coming for these things. Again, what are my views? Can You can use G JSPs and the support is really limited. I probably wouldn't really recommend anybody to start still use that one. Time leaf is good. It's pretty clean. But I think between Groovy template engine and AngularJS, if you want to cl cleanly use separate the data and the uh, client, those two things can take care of most of the most of the needs for you. So, uh, so that way, it's, uh, I think the other ones are all there for support. But some of the unexpected things, and so as I said, Rails objects cannot be domain objects cannot be converted directly to JSON. So you need to have a, either custom mapper, or you have to do some kind of as I said the command pattern kind of thing in between. So not all the XML configurations have enhancements uh, in Groovy Bean DSL. They don't have an equivalent there. If you want to have a batch in in the XML way, you could just say batch colon, and that's it. it you'll have all the batch stuff laid up there. But that doesn't work that way in the in the Bean DSL. You kind of have to define all these batch beans separately, like like you have it over here. So things like batch dot job and job repository. There are, there are some beans. I don't exactly know which ones. But you kind of have to define them because it's not by default exposed to you. So, and one, one thing to remember is you have to add this XMLNS namespace in the beginning for batch in order to make it work, or else it won't work actually. So that's why there is another thing for task. So you, you have to add that also in order to make it work. And let's see, some things are broke. So this um, that transactional does not really work right now in 1.1. It was working in 1.0, mm -hmm. so uh, so I was I was so eager to show the 1.1 in the <laughs> in the uh, in this meeting, so I switched everything to 1.1, <laughs> and then it's like transaction is breaking. So what what I really did was so this is the thing. So you have a bootstrap code here. So just like your bootstrap web Groovy, so you can have a in initializing bean. This is where I created the initial set of data, but this doesn't work because I used to have that transaction over here. It doesn't work. So the only way I did was like so. When the Spring Boot is starting up, you don't have that one. You don't have that. So it basically says that illegal state exception gone uh, is not um, some 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 errors there actually. You cannot call this method outside of GOM scope. That's basically what it says. So the workaround is pretty simple there. So I have a initialized data records in a service, and they just call that service from outside. That's all. So basically, map it to an init method, and just call that one. So it's like for for our purpose, it's pretty. For test purposes, it's pretty good. Uh, so that's it. Is gone methods are not available at startup time. I think it's a, it's a bug. It's probably open something. They already opened that one. They, they might fix it soon. So in IntelliJ, um, you cannot run the Gradle boot run directly. I don't. I have had much problems with that one. So the best thing is just to uh, run the main application. So you can just say go on, on this one. One thing that you can do is like add this thing. They add the spring loader via this command into the VM options. Now it's ready for debugging, actually. So whenever you make changes, you still have to do a reload classes. So once you do this one, you say run and then do a reload change classes. Only then it gets picked up. Otherwise, it's not like Grails. It automatically doesn't pick up. So you still have to do this one. So these are some gotchas trying to. And there's not really, really 
uh, good documentation on that one. So sometimes the port is not released. So in Windows, you can just do a fine string and then stop the process ID. Obviously, in Linux much easier. Just kill the process ID. And uh, so one thing you can do is associate the Groovy template files with Groovy here for auto formatting. Uh, so what basically means is like you have this this one here. Uh, you can just say should be associate file or something. It's probably associated now and it doesn't show up. But if it's not, it just say. So if you do that one. Uh, so if I if I just add something here and then do a, it will just let you format that cleanly. So it provides that because you are you are associated with the Groovy, it it thinks it's a Groovy DSL. So it, it's pretty it, it's very helpful. So nice to, nice to have things. I think faster creation of templates instead of going via browser and doing all that stuff, and configuration support. Maybe Groovy configuration support be good if if everything is in config object. You just uh, you can do a lot more stuff with that one. You can do some runtime stuff also. You can check what is your environment block and those kind of stuff. Actually, makes it much more powerful there. And I don't know if it's, it'll happen or not. But so some common profiles like development and stuff. If there is an out of the box, it'll be nice. Uh, expose entities are REST entities. That's how the Grails is doing that one. But we, I mean, Spring Boot is not doing that one. In Grails 2.3, you can just say um, you can just create a domain object and then say at REST or at resource. At resource and that's it. it becomes REST actually. So maybe that's a good thing. It'll be there. Maybe that's already in the making with Rails boot. It's probably there. They're already doing that one. So when do you really want to do you really want to do Spring Boot? So if you answer these questions, one of these or all of these. So if you're invested in traditional Spring Shop, want to scale your apps right now, XML configurations giving you nightmares or headaches, or you want a better deployment strategy. Microservices is being talked a lot about. And you don't want to wait for Rails boot, and all of the above, or any of the above. That's basically when you use Spring Boot, actually. And some links and references. Okay. That could go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. Thanks. Thanks to each force for this uh, opportunity. Yeah. Thanks what so. is your solution for deploying artifacts? Yeah, you can just use the jar file, create a jar file, and then draw it from the uh, server. That's it. You can run it as in any port. I mean, you can just say, you can. Uh, there's a command line property available, server dot port. So if you say dash d server dot port, and you give whatever you want, that's that's basically what it is. So that actually helps in scalability also. So if you just run multiple Java instances and you put some load balancer in front of it on different uh, uh, Java ins JVMs on different ports, put a load balancer in front of it. Since more all your data is stateless, and if you if you really write like REST REST based services, it actually makes it makes it much easier to scale. A uh, lot of examples on Spring Spring Boot is still on JUnit. The, but there, there are quite a bit of examples on in the reference documentation. Uh, there is a GitHub already. Uh, I think it's by um, by Thomas Lin, it's one of the Ruby Grails contributors. He has written a, a blog post uh, on using Spark. Actually, I have I have just only run one test case with Spark. I didn't really uh, do much after that that one. But it's it's these examples are mainly on JUnit there. But it's still possible to use Spark. Yeah, that Tomas Lin, he works at Netflix now. So right, yeah. they've adopted Spring Boot pretty heavily now until Grails 3 is out. So that's right, yeah. That's, that's what I heard too. So those guys will be pushing a lot more stuff on using Spock and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and Grails 3 is going to be based on Spring Boot actually. So I think if you if you really want, that's why I said, like if you really want to use, want to start making changes right now, Spring Boot is really good. And later on, probably you could convert to Grails, Grails Boot there. So you at least have something right now working. And it's going to be much easier, probably. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Yeah. Anything else? No. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.